Let's go to the let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, all the shopping's done, all the running around, all the worrying and scurrying, and, and here we are. We gather tonight to remember the story, the story that changed the world and has the power to change our lives. Tonight we remember particularly those who feel that they are separated from you, those who feel like they still can't get it right with you. Remember those who are struggling with family relationships. Remember those who are sick. Father, there is uh, no much joy today, tomorrow, but always lots of heartfelt concern. Send your Holy Spirit out to each one that's hurting. Comfort them. Bless them. As we come to the close of this year, we ask your blessing on the leaders of our country you would guide our, our leaders. Remind us, Father, that every day we have is a gift from you, a chance to remember, a chance to love back as you have loved us in sending Jesus the first and perfect Christmas gift. In his name we pray. Amen. Christmas Eve is the crowning moment of the Christian tradition. I've had some things on my mind for tonight. Familiar topics for those of you who call this your church home. But we have many visitors, and I wanted to talk about love and grace. As long as there are people that are nervous about coming to church... As long as there are still people that wonder if God loves them. As long as we hurry through Christmas and then are secretly glad that it's over. There's still a deficit of love. A shortage of grace. And I suggest to you tonight that there must be another path. Another way to live. In Matthew chapter 2, we find the story of the wise men. They came from the east. They came to Jerusalem. They're looking for the king. They go to King Herod and, and explain that we're looking for the baby king, and he's disturbed. He says, well, y'all be sure to find him and tell me when you do. He said, I want to go and worship him too. Of course, Herod didn't want to worship the baby Jesus. He had other ideas. The Bible says the wise men went on their way. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures. They presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route another way. This month our church has been talking about Christmas, no surprise. Some of our topics were Jesus is different than Santa Claus. He's not magic, but he can be miraculous. We talked about Christmas doesn't have to be perfect. There's so much pressure for us to just make it so, but the first Christmas was messy, and our Christmas doesn't have to be perfect. We've talked about God's love and how amazing it is and that it is the central message of Christmas. We talked about the fact that Jesus might have a Christmas list and that on Christmas everybody gets a present except him. What would be on Jesus' Christmas list? We decided surely that would include loving God and loving others in a way that we became the hands and feet of Christ and so now we come to this, this night, to this story that changed the world, to this story that can change everything 
for us. The wise men were warmed in a dream to go back another way. And we too who journey in this life have a chance to take a different road. Isaiah the prophet wrote, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. We too sometimes walk in darkness. The journey of our life can be difficult. But when we encounter Christ, our directions can change. The wise men went home a different way. The shepherds left the the manger glorifying and praising God. The angels that got to be in the choir at the shepherd's field, imagine that on your letter jacket. You know, that's not district choir or conference choir. That's like all universe choir. No one leaves this story once you really hear it. No one leaves this story quite the same as when they found it. Robert Frost wrote, I took the road less traveled, and to me it's made all the difference. Christmas is not about us. It's Jesus' birthday. It's something we enjoy, but it's not just something we enjoy. It's not just something we consume. It's something much more The birth of Jesus is not just the greatest story ever told, it's the greatest love story ever told. God so loved the world, and the story of this love can change us. What does change mean? You know, we've, almost all of us have encountered this story. Do you believe? Well, yes, I I know the facts, I believe, I know the formula. Do you, do you love him? Well, yes, I, I love him. I have the feeling my heart has been strangely warmed. Many Christians have the beliefs down and a warm feeling in their heart for God, yet their lives are still filled with fear and worry. In the old days, when I grew up, and that was the old days, the story changed you by guilt. Guilt is no one's friend. Jesus did not exercise guilt. Some people spend their lives trying to earn a love that we can never earn. We can't earn it because God offers it freely to us. The message of Christmas should smash once for all the question of whether God loves us. He gave his son. He gave his son. Will we try to keep being good enough? Will we continue to worry that we're not doing it all just right? Or will we find a life of grace? Each of us must choose. The video we share tonight makes the question clear. Let's watch. So I got a letter from my homeowners association about some violations. And it got me thinking, I think I treat God like he's the head of the HOA. (laughs) Follow me with this. HOAs have a bunch of rules. If you play by the rules, everything's great. But one little slip up, here come the violation letters. I got a trash bag in my tree. Need to weed my plants. I gotta put my address on my mailbox. My fence wasn't approved. I'm always walking on eggshells worrying that I might do something wrong or get fined. But God doesn't work this way. He's not sitting on his throne waiting for me to mess up. Mm. Grace and mercy are his style. You know, grace, uh, unmerited favor, like I basically can do nothing to deserve it. God loves me unconditionally. There's no strings attached. God loves me even though I've got a bag in my tree, even though I need to weed my plants. He is so patient with me. Through his love, he nudges me on and encourages me to work on these things. So, no violation letters, just God's unending grace. Who is God to you? Is he a rule maker or is he a grace giver? You decide.
transformation is not about us being perfect. It's not about who is right. It's about the Holy Spirit at work in our hearts. One of my professors, Bob Tuttle, used to talk about how Christians would disagree over the smallest things. And he would say, when the Holy Spirit comes in, when the Holy Spirit is really at work in a person's life, he doesn't take sides. He takes over. Imagine so much of God in your life that we're no longer worried about who the good ones are. We simply are, are filled with God's love and we want to share it with others. When I was young, we chased people with guilt. Our youth group was sent out to Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. We would go up to people and ask them if they were going to heaven or hell. Our success rate was predictable. You know, it's just, it just, especially in our society today, it, it doesn't work. Jesus did not use this method. Jesus didn't chase anyone to beg them to come back to him. People were allowed to listen, and they made up their, their own mind. In John 4, Jesus meets a woman by a well. She's been married five times. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting that's a good thing. But he doesn't s spend a lot of time condemning the woman. She also wants to argue about which is the best place to worship, this denomination or that one. Jesus doesn't bite. He doesn't argue with her about the right way to worship. He simply talks to her about the change that can happen in the life of a person when the Holy Spirit enters them. It's like rivers of living water, he said, pouring from your heart. The disciples came of their own accord they were changed by love. What an amazing thought that God could change us not by force, but that God could change us by love, a love that was so compelling that it just reached inside of us and turned us completely around. Have you ever met someone that was so good you just wanted to hang around with them? You were just drawn to them, someone that was so kind that they made you want to be more kind? Someone so generous, they, they inspired you to be more, more generous. You know, I can talk to my kids till I'm blue in the face, and I probably have, telling them what's right and what's wrong, trying to teach them how to live. But the day that they look into their dad and see a kindness and a love and a generosity, that's when people say, oh, my goodness, now I begin to get this. Christmas is the story of God's love. It is still changing lives. It is the, the work of God in the soul of men and women and boys and girls. Every year around Christmas time, I get pictures like these. That's the Virgin Mary in the coffee bar. That's the Virgin Mary playing the piano. Now, the reason I get pictures like this is because some years ago at the old church, we had a nativity set out, out front, and someone stole the Virgin Mary. I preached a sermon the next Sunday and brought that up, uh, accused a few people. Some of them might actually be in the house right now, but no one ever confessed. But occasionally there are sightings of the Virgin Mary. And they have a lot of fun with me with that. Um, I was reminded of that because a few weeks ago, uh, we were at lunch at Don Canfield's house, one of the pastors on our staff. And Don Canfield is the guy on your block who is using up all the electricity because his yard is just full of Christmas things. And in the middle of his yard, he has a nativity set. And there's lots of things to the left and the right. I mean, this is a small part of his display. But you'll notice in the... In the manger, there's no baby. And we said, oh, Don, someone stole your baby. It's happening again. He said, no, no, it's not Christmas yet. The baby isn't born till Christmas. So maybe tonight, if you go by his house, uh, the baby will, will be out. All of this is going somewhere. That reminded me of a story from the movie As If It Were Yesterday. It's about Belgian Christians who sheltered uh, Jewish children during World War II and a story of a six-year-old boy that that was placed in a Christian home 
after a while, the, the Christian family, they couldn't deal with him. And they went to the, the people that were placing the, the Jewish children. They said, he's a thief. We don't want him in our home. And the placement people sat down with the parents and said, how can he be a thief? He's just a little Jewish boy. And they explained that they'd gotten their daughter a manger set for Christmas with a little Jesus and some, some sheep and, and, and the rest. And the Jewish boy stole the baby Jesus. Our daughter's very upset. She can't sleep. So the placement worker takes the boy aside. He says, do you understand? If you end up in a camp, you'll be killed. We're trying to save your life. You can't steal from these people. Sir, the boy said, I didn't steal. I've taken Jesus to hide him. I know Jesus is a Jew, and if the Germans find him, it wouldn't be good. So I took him to save him. I want to ask you tonight if you have taken the baby Jesus, if you've taken him in, if you've chosen him. A lot of ways we go about this. Some choose him for tradition's sake. It just seemed like the right thing to do. When we're there, that always feels a little hollow. Some choose him out of duty or guilt. That ultimately feels heavy. It's not what God intended. God wants to be loved. And we are invited to respond to his love, to feel his love, to be motivated, infiltrated, to be gripped by his love. Have you taken in this Jesus, there is so much fear in this world. It's everywhere. God offers us a message that sends us down a different road. During the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge, imagine being one of the workers and you're up on the bridge. Well, as it got higher and further over the water, the pace of the work got slower and slower because the workmen were petrified. I can't imagine any pace if I was up there. I'd just be holding on, right? And after some discussion, the uh, construction company built a giant net under the, under the bridge. The pace of the work picked right up. Men still fell off the bridge, but now they weren't falling to their death. They fell, and they were saved by the net. It is not... God's intention for you to live paralyzed by fear. He has set under your life, under your bridge, under your work, a safety net. And that is the person and the gift of Jesus Christ. We can be saved. We can live without fear. There's a different way to live. We can hear this story and go home by a different route. Christmas is the ultimate story of love, and it is still changing lives. God so loved the world. The soul of God is still looking to reach into every soul that is open to hear him. If you've never experienced this life, the true life, free of guilt and filled with love, tonight when the candle comes by representing the light and love of Christ, I invite you to accept it and let his love wash the fear from your life. Let your life truly become a life filled with joy and hope. In this dark world, there is a message of freedom and hope and love. We, you, we are the bearers of that light. Please stand to receive the light of Christ.